I'm Errol Kentley, and I'd like to wax somewhat lyrical on the subject of the art of art bibles. Uh, so, as mentioned, uh, I'm Errol, I'm Director of Art at Rewind, where we do really cool stuff in VR and AR, and it turns out that I've been making digital content and games of one type or another for a rather terrifying 25 years now, and I'd like to share some of my thoughts on uh, the communication of aesthetic in intent via the medium of art bibles. So with no further ado, what we're going to cover uh, are clarity of purpose, our clarity of audience, and our clarity of style. I'm going to make a few assumptions along the way. First of all, that we have a creative brief, that we have a chosen uh, function or gameplay type, and that we have a high-level design in place. Um, so we know what we're making, we just might not know exactly what it feels or looks like at this stage. And I'm going to be using a personal project to help illustrate the, the subject matter here. It's a, an alternative take on a long-release title. Uh, as such, let's refer to it as Project Alt. Uh, it's um, a hobby piece I've been tinkering with for a little while, uh, but hopefully it's going to act as a handy framework to illustrate the subject matter as we go through. So, uh, first off, what is our... <laughs> Trifle dramatic there, but uh, uh, the clue is probably in the name. Uh, it is the, the aesthetic writ to be obeyed. Let's have a look at a couple of related examples, though. So, first off, let's, uh, let's discuss screenwriting bibles. These are reference documents that ensure consistency in ongoing television and film productions, which sounds uh, of interest, and uh, commercial style guides or brand guides. These define the core visual uh, and aesthetic elements uh, to create differentiated brands. Um, now, that also sounds rather appropriate. Let's have a closer look at um, a couple of examples and discuss what brand guys do in, in a bit more detail. So first off, they align expectations, they communicate aesthetic intent. Now, that's a big one, because that's uh, one of the, the, the main key factor, I guess, uh, in, in your average art bible. Uh, and they ensure consistency, so all of those things sound good. Uh, as we can see from these two examples from Coca-Cola and Uber, they're, they're maybe reasonably dry, but they set out the aesthetic, uh, they communicate the aesthetic intent. Uh, now, I would argue that uh, your art bible is actually probably a combination of the two, the, uh, the, the, the narrative guide and the brand guide, uh, except maybe that they, they go broader and deeper, covering topics such as uh, tone, symbolism, and there's a wealth of other topics that we'll, we'll see shortly, and that maybe they have a bit more soul to them, maybe a bit more art to the art bible, if you will. Uh, so, um, clarity of intent. Let's start with why. This is our, our raison d'etre, why we're doing what we're doing, or the, 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 the nub of the aesthetic that we're, we're trying to pursue. So, uh, you or we as the art directors must have clarity on, uh, for clarity, first of all, to be able to develop our vision and to be able to communicate it to others. So I'm going to talk about a couple of methodologies here. Bear with me, hopefully it'll all make sense. Uh, so we start with why, and from there we progress out to, to how and the what, and that gives us our intent, action, and result. Now, I'm not too worried about the action. Let's focus on the, the intent and the result for the moment. The action would be covered by things like uh, technical documentation or best practices and whatnot. What we're really after here is the, the communication of the, the aesthetic. So, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, directed opportunism. Again, bear with me here. So, um, there was this chap called Helmuth von Molt, uh, and he rebuilt the Prussian army in the 1870s, and, and why wouldn't I be talking about him and a, a, a thing about art direction and art bibles? Um, his claim to fame was that uh, he laid the groundwork for the German army's successes in World War I and World War II, which is hardly a, a glowing moral recommendation, but he did so by building a, a framework allowing units to operate autonomously. And if we look at that, look at um, the system he developed and how communications might fail, it gives us some insight into the, the role of the art bible and how we might be able to fill those gaps. Okay, so first off, we start with our, our outcomes, our, our goals the things that we are we're trying to achieve, and from there we formulate our plans, and from the plans we take actions, and then hopefully the actions actually achieve the outcomes that we set out in the first place. But, as I'm sure you're all aware, the battle plan, plan only lasts until the first engagement, so various things usually go wrong. First off, we have the knowledge gap. This is what isn't known. Then we have the alignment gap, and this is what hasn't been done, what hasn't been achieved, and the effects gap is what didn't happen overall. So these are usually the uh, the sort of the traps where things uh, go wrong. 
Um, yeah, so again, we're not too worried about the, the alignment gap here. We're, we're focusing on the knowledge gap. And the knowledge gap is really where the art Bible comes into play by communicating succinctly and clearly with the teams possibly uh, spread around the world. It's going to save on a lot of iteration. Um, an art Bible gives a, a good art Bible gives a, a framework uh, for our teams to be able to operate autonomously, which turns hopefully everyone into art directors being able to confidently create content, um, leading to less iteration, uh, greater efficiency, higher quality, more scope if we're doing less iteration. And um, that's win, 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 or win, several wins. Uh, and on a large uh, AAA project, this the, the the cost savings due to the savings in uh, the, the the clarity of aesthetic and direction could run into millions. So um, worth thinking about. Then uh, acting with intent, the 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 art bible's purpose. Now this is going to evolve over time. First of all, it might only be. Uh, um, a simple one pager or a half a dozen slides or something along those lines that brings the initial thinking together and we sell the vision up the chain. So either this is to the I know, studio direction group or our clients, whoever it might be, just to clarify the thinking and make sure that we're all that we're aligned on the, uh, the original vision for this thing. And beyond that, it starts as we start to, to build out a more depth and breadth, it's going to inform down the chain. So uh, as I mentioned, um, it might start out a little brief, so we're going to, uh, here's a couple of examples here, just um, uh, a few images pulled together for a, a sort of uh, casual racing game type thing, but it's going to evolve beyond this at some stage, uh, unless it's a short two-week project or something along those lines. If we're talking about a major project, it's going to get broader and deeper, uh, and as we do so, I see these things um, maybe living at the, the, the top of a confluence or a wiki section, but that we're investing the time in maintaining them. So, excuse me. <coughs> uh, let's have a look at the uh, the Project Alt example I was talking about a minute ago. Okay, uh, so we're going to start by running through some, some uh, framings to establish the, the vision, and hopefully in a, in a minute you'll see how these tie into the, the overall communication plan. Okay. So the project's framing. This is effectively the when and the where, and it gives us our narrative and location. Um, well, let me let me just read through. So, in this particular case, uh, a series of biological and radiological devices are detonated across London. Boom, a little bit like that. And although the city was successfully evacuated and quarantined, many remain missing and questions unanswered. Gunfire and explosions can be heard echoing from within the containment barrier and bizarre atmospheric phenomena routinely manifest. So that, as I say, gives us our, our narrative framing and gives a, a flavor for uh, what's going to be coming. <coughs> okay, let's move on to X statements. These are um, an attempt to, sync, to succinctly summarize the project. Effectively, it's our elevator pitch. Uh, and we want to be trying to uh, to evoke uh, both a sense of the gameplay and the function and its market position, and we'll circle around to the market position uh, further down. So in this particular case, we've got mercenaries battle unchecked across a tainted and forsaken London. Uh, when we're thinking about our, our elevator pitch or the words that we're using, we're trying to communicate as succinctly as possible. So we need to really think carefully about the words that we're using because words have power. Um, okay, here's an example of uh, uh, an excellent razor. Jaws in a spaceship. Now, this was the original marketing pitch for Alien. And ta-da, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, here's another one from Inno Games on um, uh, their Warlords of Adnum epic strategy, strategy of heroic proportions. And uh, it is a strategy game, hopefully epic in nature, and of heroic proportions, but also the clever wordplay there because all this, the, the character stylization, the art style they've chosen is of heroic, he ah, heroic proportions. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. And finally, we have Hell in Paradise, which I'm sure you're all familiar with for Far Cry 3, and that really does sum it up. Um, you've got these beautiful Pacific Islands with just dreadful and ghastly stuff going on there. So, great razors. They, they cut to the, uh, the, the project's core and, and communicate it. So, in this particular case, I went with Great Conflict, Greater London. 
Um, and they're, they're, they're effectively the movie poster tagline, the sort of in space no one can hear you scream. They're, they're trying to give a flavour of what's actually going on here. Greater London, actually, uh, as you may or may not be aware, generally refers to uh, the, the suburbs of London rather than uh, uh, the, the area where the combat's likely to be going on. But it actually ties in rather handily to the, uh, the London Invictus pillar uh, that you'll see in a moment. And speaking of pillars... Okay, so we have discussed the razor and the X statement. Uh, we'll also come on to tone uh, shortly. Normally I would have that during the structure of an art bulb or somewhere around here. For the purposes of this talk, I've put it slightly further down because it helps with the flow. But these effectively form our arrowhead of direction, if you will, both um, figuratively and literally. And these are hopefully pointing towards our product goals. Now, the product goals might be uh, to create a best-in-class shooter or uh, reimagining of the the racing genre, whatever it might be, that's where we should be headed. And below that, we're going to have the project pillars. Now, the project pillars might be to do with I don't know monetization uh, or um, uh, customization, high-level sort of uh, objectives for the um, the, the, the pillars. For, sorry for the uh, for the project that help us achieve the end goals. And below that, we're going to have the art pillars and probably alongside that, the design pillars and the, the code or engineering pillars as well. Now, all of these pillars, we build on top of the, the, the other sets and they should all be dovetailing in and heading towards this product goal, whatever that might be. Uh, and as you'll notice, I chose three pillars and there's a reason for this. <coughs> Bear with me again for a second. OK, you may or may not be familiar with the rule of three. Here are a few examples. Friends, Romans, countrymen, blood, sweat and tears, and snap, crackle and pop. Even the three bears. Uh, they're all quite catchy, and the reason for that is that they are the smallest achievable pattern. Uh, and again, as you may be aware, uh, hu hardwires, hardwires? Humans appear to be hardwired to, to look for, for patterns, for structure. And Rudolf Arnheim, the famous behavioural psychologist, did a lot of work on this. Um, and yeah, we appear to be set to look for these things. It also, it keeps them short, memorable and powerful and it forces simplification. So uh, when we're trying to get our, uh, our clarity of purpose, our aesthetic or whatnot, it's going to make us think about what's really important to us uh, to be able to boil it down to these three pillars. You can have as many as you want. I'd suggest, though, that uh, we, we keep it to the three. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we then need to make sure that they're memorable. There's no point in having uh, pillars that are uh, entire paragraphs long because no one's going to be able to practically apply them if they can't remember them. And to make them as memorable as possible, we need to be sticking to uh, ethos, pathos and lo logos. Uh, these are the credibility, emotion and logic, and they are the, 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 the building blocks of any storytelling. Uh, and if you want to go so far as to use the success criteria and making sure that we are telling stories, giving concrete examples, etc., then uh, I'll leave you in your own time to look up on that. But we're trying to boil these things down as much as possible, making them as catchy and memorable as possible. Almost like little snippets of, of poetry, if you want. Uh, out of the dark that covers me as black as the pit from pole to pole, etc., etc., etc. Just a little bit of something that's got some, some pith to it. If we were going to talk about, uh, I've, I've uh, known some art directors who, who would just like a single word, such as beauty, that's pretty broad. But if we say something more like stark beauty, okay, we're going to need more to back it up there, but it starts to tell more of a story, something that our teams can, can actually uh, use in anger when they're, when they're creating content for our projects. So, uh, with uh, Project Alt, the pillars I went with, went with were London Invictus, Mythic Mercs, and prevailing dissonance, which hopefully gives a flavour of, of the, uh, uh, the intent here. And I'll go into these in a little bit more detail, just as an illustration of, of how we might start building out or padding out the, the information we need to get across. So London Invictus, London Unconquered, for those of you who are not entirely familiar with Latin. Um, uh, London is ancient and glorious. When you actually look at the things that London has endured, the, the, the being raised to the ground, burned to the ground, bombed, etc., etc. It's it's horrifying, frankly. But there is so much history there, and trying to get across the 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 idea that London itself is almost a an elemental force and it's going to survive this and act as a one of the stars of the show, stars of the show, and a, a sort of mythic background um, to the, uh, the, the 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 war that's going to be waged across them. And speaking of mythic. 
Mythic Mercs. Uh, so what I wanted to do here, the idea was to uh, build our, our gameplay character types around the myth Mythic archetypes and to base their, their color choices, their pose design, animation language, shape language, all to reinforce that conceit and that they're all cool as heck and we're going to be using plausible near future tech. And I, I stress the word plausible there. We'll circle back around to that later on when we start talking about world lore and uh, narrative. Uh, next up was prevailing dissonance. There is something rotten in the state of London, something flickers at the edge of vision. So uh, there's, there's something odd going on here. Uh, we're going to be using Eldritch colour schemes and the phi ratio, which you're probably aware of, the 1.618 uh, proportion ratio that's prevalent in almost everything in nature. If we start uh, playing with those, stretching with them, breaking that ratio, things start to look odd and inhuman. And that's something that we can, we can use to put the... Uh, uh, the players or the users at uh, unease in this particular case. Not put them off, but just add a little bit of edge to the thing. And prolific evidence of evacuation, contamination, and hints of the more sinister. Uh, now, the, the idea behind all of this, that the radiological and biological devices that, uh, that were detonated actually had some kind of Cthulhu juice or something like that mixed in with them, which gives us uh, something of a free license to, uh, to, to use some of the more exotic... Um, content that we might want to apply here and just break the normal laws of, of physics etc uh, the weird weather patterns and the, the, the hinting of it so it's only ever going to be something like I don't know one percent we're never going to explicitly call this out or at least not for the foreseeable future but the um, the montage effect or the Kuleshov effect if you're uh, aware of it uh, generally allows users or viewers to infer their own meaning through very subtle placement of, of, uh, of content, of assets. They'll make up their own stories, so we can use this to good effect. Um, when we're thinking about the uh, moving down from the pillars, what we might then want to start to do is actually spell out how the, the elements of art are applied. Now, you don't have to go to, to town. Maybe there are just a, a couple that you really want to, uh, to focus on. You think these are going to be uh, very important to the aesthetic that you're developing. But if there are particular uh, relevance to certain shapes or, or the spacing or the, uh, the value uh, elements that we're going to be using, then you could pull, uh, pull them out. And the same thing with the, uh, the principles of art as well. If there are particular elements that you want to be focusing on uh, to do with uh, shape alliteration or the like, then uh, it doesn't hurt to have at least thought these things through, even if you're not broadcasting to the wider team, just to make sure that uh, you've got your own thinking in place. Excuse me again. <coughs> ah, that's better. Okay, um, and at some point you're going to want a key visual of some description. Uh, it might be uh, more involved than the quick photo bash I've done here, but this is effectively our, our game in a frame, uh, if you want. And before you start uh, getting concept artists involved and whatnot, you might want to do a, a quick effort like this. And if there's anything fast like the dynamic symmetry I've used here to, to help pull something together, then use it to your advantage. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, about the format. Uh, I would suggest in the early days that we keep these things as portable as possible. Whilst we're dealing with our, our clients or the direction groups and whatnot, we're probably going to be in various reviews, meetings and the like, and having it as a PDF or a PowerPoint or something fairly transferable um, is probably to our advantage. Um, also, keep it up to date. As this thing evolves. So if we've moved beyond the stage where it's it's just uh, you know a PowerPoint that we're, we're moving around the place and showing to various people that the project has got the go ahead, I see this thing, as I mentioned earlier, being built into Confluence or a wiki or something along those lines, and it forms the absolutes, the, the top of the chain there, uh, the very uh, the, the, the head of the section, and below that we start moving down through the various chapters and then breaking it down into separate sections within Confluence, what have you that go into the detail of how these the, 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 the intent is going to be applied in anger, be it in the, the, the technical documentation or just broadening out the content, because we're only having one slide per thing at the moment. Uh, keeping it up to date, investing the time um, to make sure that it is still relevant. Otherwise, all of the effort, the, the, the hours, possibly the hundreds of hours we've put into these things, just becomes redundant and it uh, starts becoming a, a sort of a confusing mess or maze of uh, contradictory information. So have the discipline to keep investing time in it and make sure it's still accurate. 
uh, and build on the pillars. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're going to be breaking this down through probably Confluence or wiki, uh, some form of wiki-based thing, so uh, for us to be able to uh, broaden it out for the rest of the team. Okay, let's move on to Tone, uh, if we've settled on our uh, aesthetics and what have you. <coughs> Excuse me again. First off, here's a couple of examples. Uh, first up, we have Schindler's List. And next we have Jojo Rabbit. Um, tonally, very different. Schindler's List is stark and ghastly. I mean, it's beautifully made, but it's, it's absolutely horrible, whereas Jojo Rabbit is infused with irreverent humour. Now, they both deal with, arguably, the same subject matter, the, the, the horrors of the Nazi persecution of the Jews. But they have very different takes. And this can have a huge impact on the, the aesthetics that we choose. So, as we can see from Schindel's list, the entire thing was filmed in black and white for exactly that sort of stark message, with a single splash of colour at the appropriate time. Um, this isn't going to be something that we're going to develop in isolation. Uh, we're probably going to be working with the creative director and maybe the, the narrative designers, etc. But uh, it, yes, our aesthetic choices or, or the, the steering that the tone is given going to give on our aesthetic choices could be uh, vast. Uh, now here we have another couple of uh, this time game examples: Battlefield and Battlefield Bad Company. Again, they are arguably both the same subject matter: guys with guns running around and blowing things up. However. Bad Company had a, a hilariously dark streak of humour running through it, which was a real breath of fresh air, even for back in those days. So if I can play the video... Yeah. I'm coming live from the war in... Um, what country am I in? I think I'm in Europe. Yes, so, uh, great stuff. Uh, I won't uh, uh, bore you with the details, but I'm still ranting on about how funny I thought that, that game was. I'm uh, whoop, there we go. So how's our project going to feel? So in this case... Um, let's introduce the Seriosometer, which doesn't sound very serious at all, does it? Um, in this case, it's a one-axis graph, effectively, and in a minute we'll move on to two-axis ones. At one end, we have the slapstick, light-hearted... Uh, oh, gosh, Deadpool, that's him. I forgot his name for a second there. And the other end, we have uh, Rambo at the, the grim end of things, where he's literally cutting people in half with machetes and 50 caliber machine guns and whatnot. So where might this particular project sit? <laughs> somewhere around there, um, which, okay, it's it's reasonably grim, but maybe there's some gallows humour involved as well. Uh, so, rather dramatically... <laughs> big subject. Uh, now we have a two-axis graph, and in this particular one, <laughs> with our pew-pew lasers, uh, we're going to be talking about the, the gritty versus the sanitised, and the serious versus the humorous. Um, now, I would suggest that you... Um, really seriously consider the, the, the language or the words that you're using. We might be operating on a global scale with a language barrier in the way, so make sure there are no double meanings to the words that uh, you're going to be using. If you need to label the axis to be clear, ex absolutely clear about what we're discussing, then feel free to do so. Um, beware, cliche warning here, beware the curse of knowledge. Just because you know what you, 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 you intend, what your intent is, it doesn't necessarily mean that other people are going to understand it, and we really have to focus down and make sure we're, we're communicating that as clearly as possible. Need no ambiguity. Okay, so um, we're not operating in a bubble. We need to make deliberate choices about where our project is going to sit. Uh, now, this is... Um, uh, Fairly subjective, so I'd suggest if you're putting something like this together that you do so with uh, at least a couple of other people just to make sure you've, you've got things more or less in the right place. So where is our particular project going to sit? Um, if we are, I don't know, for instance, going to end up operating the same place as Far Cry, for instance, then we better have, or another established Halo, whatever it might be, another established franchise, we better have a, a jolly good reason for doing so. Um, yeah, make deliberate choices on where you want these things to, to sit, uh, because it can have, again, considerable impacts on the um, the overall aesthetic when it comes to our tone. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, so here's an example. Um, Rage, back in 2010. Um, it was uh, good for its time, um, but in hindsight, it was fairly drab. It was browner vision, I, I think we can all agree. And the... Uh, uh, the, the, the Chaps at uh, ID obviously thought the same as well, because Rage 2 
had a very different feel in in indeed uh, the, the sort of post apocalyptic rock and roll punk uh the, the 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 palette choices the shape language the stylization of the characters they'd obviously made a conscious decision to move away from the original one and it had a big impact on the the uh, the visuals that they were going to develop as a result uh okay let's move on to the aesthetic style then <laughs> Again, rather dramatically. Uh, again, two axis graph here and pew pew lasers. Uh, for this time, we're going with photoreal to stylized and achromatic to vibrant. So here's a, again a, a few things mapped out. Um, we can't always hope to do something creative, wor creatively worthy that's going to reap financial success. Hopefully, we can, but usually it's going to be a healthy balance of creativity and marketing. Uh, projections or, or uh, marketing decisions on where exactly we're going to be uh, aiming our, our project aesthetically and how are we going to differentiate it. We need to. This is this is effectively where we make our stand for the project. We need to spell it out and communicate it. <clears throat> and uh, obviously, using reference images to, to be able to uh, allow us to do this is to our advantage. A picture speaks a thousand words, and all that, as I may well come back to in a minute. Um, uh, you don't just have to use a two-axis graph uh, if you want to use... No, we're not talking about time management. Thank you very much. Uh, if you want to use a spider graph or a radar graph as they're known, please feel free to do so. However, bear in mind that they do get a little bit complicated pretty quickly. So uh, bear that in mind um, when you're putting these things in place. Okay, so style development. Um, our aesthetic may evolve over time. Uh, you may or may not have seen these ones before. Um, Making the right choice about the audience or the visuals that we're we're we're, we're targeting uh, can have a huge impact because these end up as Fortnite and obviously they have done very well for themselves indeed. Uh, so again, think strategically. Uh, hopefully, come up with something that you're passionate about, but think strategically about uh, uh, the end result because without commercial success, um, we're probably not going to be doing this again. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, uh, visual signatures. Again, when it comes to our key aesthetic, what are the, where do we really want to be putting our, our emphasis, of, our, our aesthetic emphasis? So here are a few uh, industry examples. We've got uh, the, the Sid Mead curve from Mass Effect. We've got the, uh, the, the prevalent uh, stylization of Assassin's Creed. It turns up in their, their fonts, their um, uh, character design. Um, it, it, and the UI, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a very good stab, excuse the, excuse the pun. Uh, whereas with uh, Quantum Break, their, their key uh, game mechanic was actually a time travel uh, or time distortion thing. So most of their visual effort went on that. And so what would our one be? Would it be a, a mix of all of these things? The stylization of Journey. Where are we, again, going to make our stand? What's the important thing? Okay, let's talk a little bit about art, darling art. Um, now, art very loosely is the process of assigning meaning. So let's head through um, semiotics as they're known and how these might apply and the types of things we might need to start pulling out. Uh, so visual symbolism, uh, as you're probably uh, aware, the, the, the Hellgast from, from Killzone are basically space Nazis. You can just, at a glance, you can, you can read everything about them. Uh, from the, uh, the the chosen stylization and aesthetic, and the same is true of Darth Vader. Uh, they tried to come up with what was the most, uh, rather famously, the most obvious things, the most horrible things they could think of: death and Nazis equals Vader. So uh, that's uh, symbolism. Next, we have alliteration. Now, alliteration is the repetition of shapes that start to add meaning. Uh, in this case, I'm using Batman. So, uh, as you can see, it didn't necessarily have any deep meaning. Back in the day, it's just the bat symbol that's repeated everything on from the Batmobile to the uh, the Batarangs and even the shark repellent bat spray, which might be going a little bit too far. Uh, but uh, arguably, the, with the development of the character in recent times, that might be moving on to visual allegory. But in this particular case, I'm using GLaDOS from the, the Portal series. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, allegedly, her design was based around uh, the, uh, the the portrait of, uh, uh, of Venus, but um, whether or not that is true, for those of you who don't know the uh, the narrative, hopefully not too many spoilers here. Um, the evil genius behind this was meant to be preserved uh, in immortality in this sort of robot computer system, but he died too early, and his assistant was reluctantly forced into it, and it drove, drove her a bit crazy. Uh, 
and when you look at the, uh, the, 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 the shape language and the, the visual design, it's fairly obvious to see that it does in fact look like some kind of bound woman. So they're, they're, they're tying in a deeper meaning to the, the design that they're using. And beyond that, we have iconography. I'm sure we can all agree that uh, Master Chief's Mjolin armor uh, is fairly iconic by this point. Um, but they've also, even with the same franchise, started referencing the same shape language and uh, iconic design elements. Um, so yeah, is there anything deep that we want to be saying about the, the, the aesthetic that we're developing? Are there any particular themes? Um, as is commonly said, uh, artist isn't just a, a job title, it's, it's something that we should be living and breathing, and the, the, the core of what we're aspiring to should resonate at an emotional level. Now, having said all that rather arty stuff, let's go on to the rule of cool, because it doesn't necessarily have to be big or clever as long as it is... Awesome! Always be Batman. Yeah, uh, it doesn't have to be big or clever. If you've got a really cool idea that just works on its own merit, then fine, go for it. <clears throat> so let's circle back to brand identity for a minute. Uh, so when we're looking at targeting our, our project's aesthetic, um, we might have started off in somewhere like Battlefield. So back in the day, there were many titles uh, with no real connectivity between the, the aesthetic of the various games. Even the, the, uh, the, the logo changed from, from one project to another. And then around the, uh, I think it's the Bad Company 2 sort of era, somebody clever went, hey, we need, to, we need some kind of brand identity, and literally started uh, developing this... Uh, uh, the stylization. I mean, you, at a glance, if you see somebody striding or sprinting in a fairly uh, symmetrical composition towards the, the viewpoint, um, obviously a soldier with uh, orange VFX and orange glow on them, it's probably going to be a battlefield game at this, at this particular stage. Um, and in a similar way, Disney, uh, Disney Infinity uh, developed uh, uh, a consistent aesthetic to run across all of the, the House of Mouse's really, really diverse um, IPs, uh, and they, they, they developed a brand identity. So, for Project Alt, <coughs> excuse me, first of all, we're developing our, our visual uh, fundamentals. This is generally the, the, the logo, so in this particular case I'd use the union of the Illuminati and Biohazard ones, uh, icons rather, with a dash of the uncanny, which you may have seen there. Uh, Typography-wise, I chose Simplifica simply because it's, it's futurist and elegant. Uh, and when it came to the key colours, uh, I kept it fairly pure, stark, and maybe a touch of eerie. And rather handily, it also works with um, colour blindness as well. And we'll come back to that, I think, in just a second. With maybe there's going to be some uh, dashes of uh, accent colour when it comes to uh, key effects or the UI and whatnot. So when we're considering our palette choices, our colour scheming, if you will. Uh, obviously, we're, we're going to have the, uh, the usual stuff about uh, choosing complementary colours, etc., etc. But maybe we also need to think about the psychology of uh, perception when it comes to colours. Now, arguably, this stuff hasn't been scientifically proven, but I would argue that corporations around the world spend millions, if not billions, uh, to develop their identities, and they very carefully choose the colours involved. BP, for instance, went to the green flower, uh, Coca-Cola has red because it's exciting. Uh, these things don't happen by accident. But if we're dealing with a, a global audience, then we have to bear in mind that colours mean different things in different parts of the world. So where is our target audience going to be and are there any particular considerations around that? Uh, we also have to probably bear in mind the existing tropes in the uh, the area that we're operating in. Everyone knows red barrels explode, right? Uh, and again, accessibility, as I briefly touched on. If there are obvious no-nos when it comes to uh, colour choices, so for instance, Bioshock 1 back in the day uh, made the uh, slight error of including uh, red and green as part of one of the, 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 the mini-games, which actually had quite a big steer on how well you could play the game, which obviously for red and green colourblind people was, was uh, you know, ruled them out of it, made it almost unplayable. Uh, so um, we can probably handle that via code or UI in this day and age, but we might want to bear that in mind when we're making our choices uh, about the, the, the font sizes or the, the palette that we're going to be using, etc. Okay. <coughs> So, uh, the visual alliteration for Project Alt, uh, I chose the triangle as the repeated motif that would turn up in 
uh, asset designs, UI, VFX, and the like. And I did this because um, it's fast and it's sharp. Uh, there's 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 associations there already. It already has meaning. And beyond that, I wanted to take it uh, or, or tie into the occult associations. And because that starts taking it into a, a deeper meaning rather than perhaps the, 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 the shallow side of things with the fast and the sharp, that makes it a, a visual allegory, just to give that as an illustration. And I also inverted the thing for imbalance. <clears throat> also, it's an arrow pointing downwards, which uh, can also infer certain meanings too. Okay. Um, again, we're not operating the bubble. That was my uh, the the inverted triangle was my choice, and luckily for me, this was a hobby piece, never for commercial uh, exploitation or anything on those lines. But um, along came control not that long ago, which also by chance had chosen the inverted pyramid and exactly the same thing. Uh, it was a uh, uh, also a game based around the uh, occult and what have you, uh, and they'd also tied it into their, their key VFX, their UI, pretty much everything. So uh, that could have been embarrassing. Luckily for me, not so. However, uh, Far Cry New Dawn. Uh, that was a fairly uh, punky, pink-flavoured take on the, uh, the apocalypse, which might sound familiar, because so was Rage 2 from earlier. And they came out both around the same sort of time. So... Uh, Keep an eye on, I guess, the rest of the, uh, the the marketplace, what they're doing, and maybe have a backup plan um, if there's another key aspect that you could use as as uh, you know a switch in, then it might be to your advantage. So choose wisely. <clears throat> uh, back at the start, uh, I originally came up with a brief aesthetic target. So this was my original sort of one slide about what the world might look and feel like: uh, clear and uh, readable visuals. Uh, high tones and contrasts, and holographic effects with designer graphical corruption. <clears throat> so that was my original stab, and maybe we want to go beyond that sort of thing as we start developing it uh, into the this, not this. I know uh, not everybody is keen on these, maybe feel they're a bit on the nose, but they can have their advantages, and I also know equally as many people who are large fans of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, uh, in this case, I've spelled out a, a few areas here, and given their, their rough feel, and then their counterparts of what it does not feel like, the this and the not this. So, for instance, the VFX is going to look more like this than maybe uh, the, the sort of cartoony style here, or is the combat mechanic going to be a cover-based thing, or is it going to be uh, fluid and involve uh, a great deal of movement? Uh, which segues nicely into uh, GIFs, because we frequently are going to need to communicate motion of one type or another. And as we know, a picture speaks a thousand words, so at 24 frames a second, that's not go not doing too badly, is it? And if I was going to uh, call out combat pillars, for instance, there might be some, some areas here that uh, really are, are based around movement. If I wanted to uh, communicate the fact that this is going to be a high impact, high visibility and high tech uh, affair, then... Um, this page might be getting a little bit noisy, but with uh, 12 images there, that's almost 300,000 words, uh, which makes it full of win! Hurrah! Yeah, you might want to tone it down a little bit here, but... Uh, and watch your file sizes too, as well. The more uh, videos and animations, obviously, you put into your decks, the less portable they become. <coughs> okay, let's move on to the, uh, the world lore. Um, so this is how the, the narrative might relate to the art. Again, in the same way that uh, tone might have a big influence, uh, the, the sort of uh, the narrative framing of the project could also have uh, a big impact. So here we have a, a Batmobile. It's got all the right stuff. It looks kind of fast. It looks sleek. Uh, it's got the bat wings on it, and it's entirely plausible. Um, now, on the right-hand side, we have a credible take on it. Uh, so this is slightly about tone, but also about our, our, our narrative world and the, the kind of um, aesthetic we're going to be developing. I mean, neither of these is necessarily wrong. It depends on the world they're going to inhabit. But obviously it can have a significant influence. Uh, if the kind of technology we have in the world is if it's a high-tech world, then are they going to have force fields? Are they going to have teleporters? Are they going to have cloaking devices? Is there going to be magic of some type in the world or not? Uh, and if so, what type is it going to be? Is it going to be a hard magic system as Doctor Strange was? Or maybe even Harry Potter, if you wave your wand in a particular way uh, and, and shout Expelliarmus, it does a set thing. And also from the uh, the... the uh, the shields that uh, uh, Doctor Strange has pulled up there, they have a specific aesthetic to them, as does moving to the mirror dimension and so forth. Um, 
Uh, conversely, I'll be going to maybe have a soft magic system, uh, such as Lord of the Rings, where uh, basically Gandalf can do cool stuff when it's narratively convenient. Uh, even if we are going to be doing that, behind the scenes we're probably going to have to have some kind of covert structure, otherwise it's just freeform. We need to know what effects he's going to be able to pull into place, and we need to develop an aesthetic for them. <coughs> okay, um, so world lore uh, on the alt side of things. Uh, first off, um, well, credible detailing. If, for instance, we wanted to uh, differentiate our aesthetic by... Uh, having, I don't know, uh, green muzzle flashes. That would actually involve some kind of copper sulfate, and if they were going to be blue muzzle flashes, it would be some, It would be involve uh, copper chloride, which I'm sure we all knew, right? Um, so knowing our subject matter is to our advantage. Now, we don't necessarily ever have to broadcast this, but investing the time in finding some stuff out uh, about the world that we're actually going to be uh, developing will help uh, inform the aesthetic choices that we are making. So smart cloth, that's pretty much already a thing, but maybe this could tie into uh, um, customization or emoticons being displayed, something along those lines. Uh, graphene, if you're aware of it, is a uh, an atom-thick, diamond-hard synthetic material, which, uh, although it hasn't been able to be mass-produced yet, is very much on the horizon and could change a large uh, the, 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 the sort of parameters of human, human existence. Now, it's already been developed in ways that it can change its color based on... Uh, uh, electrical technology, but without too much uh, creative extrapolation, it could probably be used for cloaking technology or something along those lines as well. By making sure that we've developed these rules around the technology, we can confidently then start being able to build a, a, a consistent world and consistent aesthetic language. Um, Next up, uh, we might want energy weapons, and even if we don't want the pew pew lasers from earlier, uh, plasma seems a reasonably safe bet. Uh, in the near future, because it's um, it's plausible, uh, and also the same with force fields. Now, um, it may not be the sort of Star Trek force field of of your, but if you're familiar with BAE's um, investigations and research into force field technology, they're effectively using uh, bursts of plasma that get set off in the direction of the incoming threat. <coughs> plasma by itself has quite a, a unique visual signature. Um, and also uh, this science behind it too. So this this um, plasma welder is actually using a hydrogen-based uh, system, whereas if the um, if the the flame was coming out blue, that would involve carbon tetrafluoride, which um, <laughs> we don't necessarily need to know. But maybe there's something there that helps us inform the gameplay type. So maybe purple is the force field and blue is the gun, uh, is the weapon system, or something along those lines. And maybe it denotes different uh, functionality or characteristics in the same way that different coloured lightsabers have different characteristics in Star Wars. Uh, another reasonably safe bet uh, are rail guns or electro electromagnetic guns. Excuse me. Ah, good. A quick swig of gin there. Uh, so gorse weaponry, and they also have a, uh, a fairly obvious uh, or unique visual signature due to the high levels of kinetic, en kinetic, kinetic energy that they actually um, uh, they, they involve. Uh, and, yeah, getting this framework in place allows us to consistently develop a visual language. Okay, um, chapters. So I've uh, I've touched on a few of these uh, earlier. Um, what I would envisage is as we develop our art bibles further, that we start ticking off all the major areas of the game. What are the things we really need to focus on? Uh, is there going to be something about the, the down-barrel experience if it's a shooting game, or uh, I don't know, how a car goes really, really fast and the effects tied into that and how it kicks up dirt or what have you? If there are important aspects of it, we should at least have a, uh, a slide or a heading about it that then gets developed further by our teams as we start to work out the nitty-gritty. Uh, maybe we, the, uh, the atmospheric phenomena is going to have something to do with it. The, the screen effects, if we want something to do with... Um, uh, lens distortion or uh, chromatic aberration, uh, maybe modularity is a big deal. If we are working to tight time or financial budgets, actually building things uh, from sets, from modular designs, might be uh, a big deal and might actually become a key element of our aesthetic. Um, holographic route leading might also uh, come into play, particularly if we want this, this, this fluid movement system where we want people stalling or uh, you know, sniping, 
camping around the place or what have you that actually might be a big deal the golden route of how we uh, how we set that sort of stuff out um, so here are a few examples how might materials behave are there any specific things uh, or stylization that we want is it going to be uh, um, stylized is it going to be painterly is it going to be uh, photo real is the detail going to fall off with a sort of broad brush strokes range, the, 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 the tonal ranges become more readable at close, uh, the closer we get, and then at close quarters we amplify the specular maybe. How are the materials going to behave in different lighting conditions, different weather conditions? Uh, if we need to start spelling this stuff out so our, our, our art teams can start confidently uh, moving ahead with as little as, um, iteration as possible, then giving clear visual guidance is going to be to our advantage. <coughs> Okay, uh, so if we're going to pull out some examples on the animation side of things, maybe there are some specific principles of animation in the same way that we looked at uh, briefly at the principles of art earlier on that we want to be uh, pulling out. So uh, when it comes to pose to pose, fluid motion, as I mentioned earlier, so we're going for key poses uh, at the beginning and then fast motion in between, so uh, rather like this example here. Uh, and next up, um, so this isn't going to be a documentary, we're going for embellished action, it's drama over realism, and key dramatic poses, signature poses for the various character types uh, and classes, the archetypes we were mentioning earlier. Bing. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on the, uh, the world or the environment side of things, just to show... Um, uh, I guess a bit more detail. If, if there are areas that are important, maybe we want to delve into them in a, uh, a little bit more clearly. Okay, so um, whatever world we're building for whatever project or game, uh, there's usually some kind of history there. And in this particular case, with the, the detonations going on London, there's a fairly clear one. We have the pre-incident normality, then the, the incident itself, and then the evacuation, the post-incident quarantine, and then the present with the, this covert power struggle going on. Um, now there may be universal things between this that we want. We want clarity of each one scene. So the mess it on sin, uh, making sure that uh, every scene is readable at a glance. Uh, obviously this is an art installation and it makes me chuckle every time. We're not necessarily going to be doing that. Or dropping safes on people's head for making sure that at a glance people get the gist of what is going on in a scene. It may not be quite this horrific, this is a little bit too on the nose, uh, but there may be elements of, uh, of that in the scene that allow them to tell what's going on. Uh, occasional moments of, uh, of, of of pathos where we just we get them to pause for a second and think about the human cost of what might have been going on in the city, and then the Stranger Things side of things, maybe the Hiroshima shadows, uh, the, uh, the, the 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 occasional pentagram, whatever it might be, the the hints of the uncanny. Uh, so this is our this is the the our filter, how we're viewing the world. Um, uh, how we describe the world through what's going on in the, in the narrative side of things. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so talking about the scene setting, scene setting, we've got the pre-incident, as I mentioned, all of its London in all of its diverse glory, trying to make sure that it's authentic, it feels like uh, uh, London, and that it's got the right topography, that it's not just sort of Big Ben right next to the Tower of London or whatnot. It's actually going to make sense that it, it, it feels like London, feels and looks like London. Uh, uh, as I banged on about earlier, uh, London is ancient and glorious, so um, take advantage of that. We have cutting-edge modernism right next to the old Roman walls or the, uh, the monument to the, the fire of London. There's huge diversity there, and we can use that to good effect in the, with the, uh, the, the canvas that we're using to, to, to paint the worlds on. And then the mundane, why not have uh, this referred to as well, the, the roadworks, the, the tourism, etc. What was going on beforehand? And then actually the incident itself, the detonations, the contaminations. So, boom, there we go. Uh, blast damage around the place. Um, so we're not talking necessarily about nukes, but there would be conventional explosive damage, and that can be shocking enough in its own. Uh, the firestorms that may have followed. And then the, uh, the the literal and figurative fallout of what might have happened as a result of that, and then the response um, to the, the the immediate consequences of the uh, the, the blast, the, the detonations going off. So we're starting to move down through the uh, the timeline here. Next up, post incident: wind blows down lonely streets, some areas and unscathed, most bear heavy witness. Um, so again, we're trying to sort of tell these little narrative snippets that hopefully mean something. Uh, the 
uh, abandoned infrastructure of uh, the evacuations. This becomes more relevant through the the, the fairly recent uh, Chernobyl TV series. You know, the, the the abandoned army lorries, the fire trucks, all of that stuff can be used to good effect in the storytelling and um, create gameplay uh, arenas as well. <coughs> as you may have seen from the, the recent Last of Us, the, the army blocking off different areas of the city helps frame the game levels. Uh, the unrest, sporadic looting, and then the quarantine, the contamination walls being uh, rigged up around the place and the checkpoints, again, will give us uh, not just framing for the aesthetic, but also framing that we can use in our compositions uh, and the gameplay arenas too. Uh, and then the current, something going down in London town. Uh, frozen time, uh, similar idea, again, to, we've, we've probably all seen the, the, the photographs of Chernobyl and how that's evolved over the last 30 years. So it's only been six months, but because there is weird stuff afoot, we can accelerate decay, we can, we can play with the, uh, uh, the timescales here, time here and how fast things are actually progressing. And obviously evidence of the, the secret wars going on, uh, the charred helicopter wrecks, etc., etc. So through there we can build these the the, the layered history. Um, we don't have to use all these elements all the time, but by um, weaving them in and out, we can build a consistent world and give uh, narrative and visual diversity. <coughs> Uh, and I'm just going to briefly harp on again about London, because if you've got something you're passionate about, then then make that clear. Uh, London is such a, a huge and diverse city. It's, it's got so much history to it. Uh, it's it's really is true. When you're tired of London, uh, you're tired of life. Um, it's, it really is an, an epic backdrop and one of the real stars of the show that could be used in this particular thing uh, and could really be exploited, if, if you want, uh, to good effect. Obviously, mixing them with the, uh, the 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 storytelling elements we've we've uh, uh, discussed a moment ago. Okay, uh, so let's start wrapping things up just a little bit. What we've covered are our clarity of purpose, making sure that we have a clear idea so we can communicate it to others. That we've got our the uh, our our why narrowed down, absolutely nailed down our clarity of audience, who we're going to be targeting uh, as this thing evolves over time, and our clarity of style. We've absolutely nailed what the thing is going to look like uh, by getting our own ducks in a row and then being able to communicate it to others through the art bible. <coughs> so, uh, some closing thoughts. The art bible is, is going to be aspirational, um, but it's pointless making promises that, uh, that, that we can't deliver on, so I would suggest that we always sanity check it. Before we go too wide with this thing, that you uh, we, that we discuss these our, our aspirations with uh, with uh, with engineering uh, and production, you know, there's you're going to have uh, both technical and financial budgets to operate within, and we need to try and make sure that uh, even if we're aiming for the stars and we're going to hit the moon, that we're we're not over promising and that we're going to. Uh, we're going to be able to achieve what we're setting out here. Having said that, if there's something that you feel is absolutely vital you want to make a stand on, then then do so. But uh, we may need to be pragmatic pragmatic about it. Uh, and as I was uh, mentioning earlier, keeping it current. Invest the time in making sure the thing is up to date. Otherwise, all the, the, the effort you've spent on it so far starts becoming redundant. Uh, so in closing, then, the Art Bible is there to inspire and inform, and uh, in my humble opinion, it should be a thing of beauty in its own right, almost like the, your, your coffee table book. Um, it, it's something that we want everyone to aspire to, so at the end of the day, you set the bar, we set the bar. If, if we are going to be presenting this vision, then the time and effort that we put into these things is hopefully going to pay dividends. As a marvellous quote by Francis Atterbury, it's attention to detail that makes the difference between the average and the stunning. I'll leave you with that. Thank you for your time.